if it turns out that at the end of the day in the migration to a blockchain mediated civilization infrastructure, the electricity cost of running that infrastructure is say the electricity cost of Canada, but it replaces the nation state, the military industrial complex, the, the entire legal and banking infrastructure. That's a good trade. It's a really good trade. Uh, I have noticed an injection and that language in, implies that I think is something deliberate about it uh, of, a, of, a, of a meme, a narrative that talks about the NFT space as bad in the context of energy consumption. I'm sure you've seen this. Yeah, I think I read it in uh, Seth Godin's post. He mentioned that, yeah. <laughs> Funny. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I know him a little bit as a point of signal. So I, 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 I think his post title is something like why NFTs are bad or something like that. Yeah, there you go. All right. So he, 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 the fact of that tells me a lot because I've, I've mapped him as being a, uh, what's the term, like a midwit signal? Yeah. Like very, very high capacity to produce things that look like they're sophisticated, but are in fact not, but are well right. cultivated to get significant attention. A lot of folks like that. All right, so from what I can tell, most of what we're seeing in that narrative is like unalloyed virtue signaling, which is, hey, we've sort of, we've spent our virtue signaling in a bunch of different locations and here's a new one. And we're looking for how do we signal that we're on the right side of history? How, how do we signal we're on team right side of history? And now that that's, that's been identified, if you don't signal that you're on team right side of history, by definition, you're on team wrong side of history and we're creating a new you know, in-group, out-group dynamic. And that's, as far as I can tell, like that's 98% of what's going on in that particular environment. Um, and what I would do is I would sort of double, single click and double click on the inquiry. Single click has to do with a slightly more robust analysis of the actual cost structure. So if you take a look at uh, any two objects that are roughly parallel. So I've got my uh, Van Gogh $2,500 oil painting and I've got my Van Gogh NFT. And I look at the embodied energy and I have to actually do an accurate accounting. I have to take a look at the entire supply chain all the way from the bottom up to look at what's manifesting here. But I can't um, take a look at 1% of this and 100% of this, otherwise I'm not doing a, an et cetera paribus. But if I look at the whole supply chain, so what does it take to produce the canvas? What does it take to transport the canvas to a location where it can be acquired by an artist? What does it take to produce all of the oil paints and the brushes? You know, all the underlying characteristics, I have to take that entire multi, multi-variable supply chain, concentrate them into the moment of the artist creating the actual painting, including quite likely a uh, frame, which is a non-trivial economic artifact itself. And then just for the moment, let's just look at the embodied energy. Uh, of that and the externalities associated with the mode of production of that embodied energy because they're not fungible. Right? The, the production of oil paints is not the same as the production of electrons. These are, these are, they throw different externalities. And if you compare the two, you know, the net net cost of a canvas instantiation of a painting is on the order of 15 to $20, maybe more depending on a lot of particularities, it ranges a lot. And the embodied energy cost of a NFT is on the order of $2. So 10x cheaper in terms of the actual embodied energy of the footprint now. That's a great point. So, so you're basically saying the, if you look at NFTs as trying to capture the signature of the artist, right? Versus the art itself. Yeah, yeah. The thing that can prove that the artist did, like made this thing, sold it to whoever they sold it to. And by the way, the signature is the NFT. The, the cost of proving the signature in the NFT is just, a whole lot cheaper than the production of, let's say, physical good in, in your example, the Van Gogh artwork. Well, that's, that's the, you're actually at 1.5. One, one so let's, let's do one real quick and then go to two because sure. there's a lot more to two. So in one, I'm just literally talking about, in this case, the digital art, which happens to be maybe even superfluously wrapped in the crypto structure, but it has as a, uh, a core benefit that I can prove provenance. And say so that's the center, that's the comparison with the, so I'm buying the art, in principle, I have a lot less use value because I can't hang it on my wall. Although, of course, I could. But let's just, for the moment, ignore that. Um, so I'm just looking at the analog painting against the digital painting and the NFT wrapper and the signature. And that's that's that. And there's Ceteris Paribus and the embodied energy of producing those two. Okay. If I double click, I have to actually look at the context. 
the context includes all of the socio-cultural artifacts that are associated with this particular object. So when I look at the analog art, I've already talked about things like, okay, I have to, if I buy it, I have to transport it. There's a physicality associated with the movement of it from the place of buying it to the place that I keep it. I also have to store it. And there's something about the object, the storage that takes up space. Um, to a meaningful extent, there's some implication of things like the transfer of money. If I'm buying it in US dollars, I'm actually invoking by implication a payment processing system and a banking system that's associated with the economic structure that I'm participating in. I'm, I'm engaging in analog economics, and which implies late stage capitalism, implies fiat currency, implies nation states that police the laws associated with and enforce those laws using military power. I'm also invoking copyright. Right? For the most part, uh, particularly when the price point is anything above strictly labor of the art that I'm purchasing, the gradient of that is entirely associated with the legal regime. Right? If I wanna be able to buy uh, not even my Van Gogh, I'm buying something for like $15,000 and the underlying effort to create it was call it $2,000 of time and labor, that gradient is associated with the legal regime of copyright. The legal regime of copyright invokes the entire judicial and enforcement apparatus associated with copyright that maintains the integrity of that and the cost structure of it. So I have to start taking these, the, uh, the aliquot portion of those entire sociocultural infrastructures and the externalities that they throw into the environment if I want to do a ceteris paribus. Because in the NFT space, all of that is tied up in the embodied energy of the Ethereum blockchain. And so it's not just providing me with the instantiation of the digital object. It's not just providing me with the crypto signature of the provenance. It's also providing me with the entire payment infrastructure, the entire transportation infrastructure, and the entire whatever legal infrastructure that I'm going to be dealing with. I don't even need copyright anymore. The whole point of the crypto is it's replacing that. And I can, by the way, if I want to, I can actually go further and start looking at even further instantiations out there, like the art gallery in which the painting must be situated to attack, attract the attention necessary for it to achieve a gradient in value associated with the quality that it has in the marketplace is an embodied energy cost of significant intensity. Right? I took a look at the Bilbao Museum in Spain. By itself, the titanium embodied in the Bilbao Museum is more than the entire embodied energy associated with the Ethereum blockchain, for example. And that's part of the underlying infrastructure of the art world. Right? So, to do that double click requires you actually begin to realize, oh, we're actually looking at two complete, completely distinct civilization visions that are actually co-resonating. This one is late stage. This is an S-curve at the top of its S-curve and we've rendered most of it unconscious. We tend to not perceive its artifacts as being implicated in the whole. This one is almost entirely conscious. Every moment of it implicates the whole. Right? We actually take and impute the entire cost of the entire Ethereum blockchain to an NFT, partly because it's legible. The gas cost actually is a real thing, but we don't, we aren't witness to the degree to which the surface area, or in fact, in this case, the volume that is actually being covered in that expansion. And we aren't witness to what that looks like as it expands out further and further and further. So now I'm gonna broaden NFT space. I'm gonna take NFT space and really broaden it because now we're actually looking at things like smart contract space, which is, a piece of what, what, one of the things that makes NFTs work as a, as a thing at all is they're embedded in smart contracts, right? And the implication of crypto as payments, as enforcement, as jurisprudence, as law, like all of that, which still, of course, is going to need to be explored. We haven't actually really gotten to the point we've covered the edge, but just think about like the evolutionary process of, you know, what are, the, what are some of the characteristic failure conditions in smart contract space? We've already explored many of them. A poorly written smart contract will be hacked and the value will be taken. A poorly written analog contract will be cheated on and we'll have to litigate. And these are, these are parallels. We've already gotten to the point where we actually are producing smart contracts in NFT space that are holding millions of dollars of value, which is actually quite a long way. Most economic activity can handle can, can, can handled inside that frontier. So in terms of the evolution of the ability to begin to do economic uh, interactions inside smart contract space in the NFT phenomenon has actually begun the process of proving out, exploring, uh, and, and um, demonstrating by, by reality, by actually holding contracts of that value, that smart contracts are ready to hold contracts of that value, which is potentially a huge migration.
So I don't need to have uh, you know, necessarily like police forces, for example, uh, at least to, to a meaningful extent, a large chunks of those begin to go away. I don't need to have banking infrastructure. So that's important. Like we're actually looking at something now. So I'm going to hold that to say, okay, first order, we're talking about NFT space. What's happening in NFTs is part of a much larger story. And a big part of that much larger story is the migration of the entire socio-technical infrastructure for governing and running civilization from this one to some new possibility that has very different characteristics. And you have to take the whole accounting of that if you really want to look at it. So you say, oh my God, crypto costs as much electricity as Argentina. Fair enough. And that's a lot. And by the way, there's S curves in terms of how efficient we can make it and possible phase transitions in the underlying technology that can and will be explored as that becomes a meaningful thing to be explored by that collective intelligence. But if it turns out that at the end of the day in the migration to a blockchain mediated civilization infrastructure, the electricity cost of running that infrastructure is say the electricity cost of Canada, but it replaces the nation state, the military industrial complex, the, the entire legal and banking infrastructure. That's a good trade. It's a really good trade. Right. The externalities of that can be much more tightly monitored, right? Hydroelectric energy the is not the same I have thing as in my gas. mind is like I'm stacking the infrastructure. And on the one hand, I'm seeing like the stack is like that high. And on the other hand, I'm seeing like the stack is this high. It's just a lot simpler. Very simple. But in this case, the stack is more legible, which is what would make like a set code in write that blog post. In that case, it's very much not legible. Right. It's been rendered illegible by the fact that it's the water in which we right. have been born. And it's very complex to track it all out. Right. So it's almost like there, there's like hidden middlemen in that in that other stack kind of cashing in. Like, like Seth Godin that. himself, for example, <laughs> yeah. right. who is, who's hijacking our attention allocation function, which is a big piece of the hidden costs in this stack, yeah. is our attention allocation function is, 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 has been radically exploited. This is our sense-making problem. Right? We can't actually orient our attention to the right things and get very clear signal of what's really happening that gives us the best uh, context to make the most effective choices. And as far as I can tell, this entire crypto infrastructure is actually part of the transition move, not part of the steady state at the end. Um, but maybe a necessary part of the transition move. Right? So if you, adolescence may not be pleasant, but you don't get from kid to adult unless you go through it. At least it's legible is what, is what comes to my mind, right? It's At very the legible. Least, it's transparent, legible. Right. You can see it. There's no hidden moves associated with it. It's highly trustworthy. Right. Right. It's it's designed to be very difficult to corrupt. Right. In terms of middlemen, how much corruption is currently hidden in the unconscious blind spots of the civilization in which we've operated at multiple different levels, like many, many different levels. Right. Probably a third of our entire civilization right now, maybe even as much as three quarters, maybe more. Like if you think about that measure of how much of our jobs are bullshit jobs and like 80 or 90% of people self-report that their jobs are bullshit jobs, maybe 95% of our entire civilization structure is just corruption. Well, if you move from a system which where corruption has lots of places to hide to a system where it's fully transparent and has a full accounting built in intrinsically and legibly, and uncorruptibly, perhaps you're able to actually go from a 95% corruption to a 3% corruption. And the, the energetic cost structure of that may in fact be so tremendous, that's the thing that saves the day. Just that, just that gap. In fact, I would propose probably so. And in that place, the, sh the opening up of the possibility of collective intelligence now that we're not burdened by a 95% corruption tax is what has the possibility then of exploring the real concrete problems that we actually are facing right now, what Tyson calls the thousand year uh, regeneration, or maybe he doesn't use those words, but that's, you know, he points in that direction to actually navigate that. So for us to get from here to there, we've got to make this move. Once we've made this move, we're now sitting in a place that has the kind of underlying intrinsics that we can then consciously say, okay, now we're going to make the move to the next place.